Good morning. Well, it's good to, good to see all of you here. And um, are you looking forward to a feast on God's Word this morning? There must be an expectancy, not to hear a speaker per se, but really to say, Lord, I want you to speak to me. All right? Your Word from the, the Word of God brings life. So why don't we pray together and ask God uh, to bless our time. Father, we thank you that um, we are gathered here to worship you, to glorify you, and also, Lord, to wait on you because you have called us to be a people that belong to you. And uh, we ask Holy Spirit to open our hearts, to hear, to listen, and to apply what you have got to say for us this morning to your word. So, Father, help me, Lord, to proclaim your word clearly and powerfully with the might of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. What is a mystery? What is a mystery? Well, a mystery is often something that is shrouded in secrecy. It's something obscure, cannot be explained. I'm sure some of us who, well, not many of you, but a few of us who were growing up in the 60s, uh, we have heard of the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle where um, ships and planes mysteriously vanished without a trace. Or you have heard of the mystery of Atlantis, an island with advanced civilization that was mentioned by Plato in some of his works. But up to today, its locations could still not be found. There are many popular books that are mystery books. Uh, I grew up with uh, some of the Enid Blyton books, Secret Seven, Famous Five. The youth, are, this, are you still familiar with these uh, classic mystery books? Or are you into Nancy Drew's mystery stories? So when we talk about mysteries, it can come across to us as something that is uh, dark, something ominous, something sinister, something foreboding, something bad, unpleasant, like death or people that are missing. That's what you t uh, normally classify mystery. It's not always something that is like good. And here in chapter 3, in the letter to the Ephesian Christians, Paul talks about a certain mystery. So we're going to read that in a, in a minute. This, he talks about the mystery of Christ. But you have to realize that the meaning translated from the Greek word, a mystery, has a slightly different uh, understanding as what the English word mystery uh, will mean for us today. It really means that it's something that is uh, it's a plan that has remained hidden by God, and uh, man's knowledge will not be able to find it out. In other words, this is a secret plan of God that is beyond human knowledge. This mystery can only be uh, revealed by God himself, and nobody could have guessed this mystery. So that is the meaning of the word mystery. So let's turn to Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to read from verse 1 to 14. A. Let's read together, shall we? Okay. Let's read together. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations, and it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and share us together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace, given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden 
in God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you therefore not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, and, and so on. Starting from chapter 3, uh, verse 1, Paul began to write. He says, For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. Can you go back to the uh, slide number 2? Uh, to highlight this verse 1, okay. So what can you see there? That is a little bit, uh, can you go back previously, all the way through, yeah, okay. Can you see something that is a little bit strange in his uh, literary style? What can you see? Well, some of us who have been taught English, right, if you were to sit for O-level or A-level English and write, and do, to write an essay, your teacher will say, do not put colon and dash, all right? That is not part of a good English essay. Neither should you put dash, dashes, and so on. And here, Paul actually sort of like uh, wrote here, for this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, dash, and I said, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace. So, in Greek, you do not have punctuation, all right? Definitely no dashes, no commas, no full stop. But basically, if you read Greek, you just find that there's like a break and a diversion from what Paul was trying to say. And let me ask you another question. Where do you think that he reconnects his diversion? All right, you need the Bible because at which verse do you think he then sort of come back to his general flow. No, then it's on the way there. It's actually in, in chapter 3, verse 14. Because it starts with, for this reason, I, Paul, and then it went on, and then he says, for this reason, I knew before the Father. That was the last statement that we all read. So for the next 13 verses, it actually went on an excursion to elaborate something to the Gentiles. And there must be a reason why Paul actually went a, a bit of a diversion to emphasize something. And this is what we're going to study today. And this is a classic example of how the Holy Spirit inspires the author. In other words, the Holy Spirit does not overrule the personality of the writer. The Holy Spirit did not tell the New Testament writers, now write this, you know, for this reason. Yes, next, I, yes, Paul. In Greek, that's not the case. It's just that they're inspired. And here Paul uh, may have broken a, literally, a, a good literary flow, but that's because his heart suddenly turns on the Gentiles to say, I have to say something about this. And therefore, he put a dash. And his digression was to continue to elaborate on this mystery of Christ, which he touched on. He said, I wrote to you briefly earlier on. And what is this? A mystery. Well, we know that this mystery has been revealed by God that could never have been guessed by human beings or by angels. And some of you who are not believers, I, let me just explain a little bit about the mystery of this of Christ. And that is basically, who would, who would have been able to guess that God will become man, will take on human flesh in order to pay for the sins of the world so that men and women who have sinned against him would be able to receive forgiveness. He has to do it all this way. When the Bible tells us that man, in, in Romans chapter 8, that man in his fallen nature would never submit to God's law. That is a mystery. How could God be able to turn the hearts of men and women that are so rebellious against God that can never submit to his rule but ever come back to him? And so that is a mystery. That how God can reconcile between his nature who is just and yet, his nature is also merciful. In other words, if you are a just man, 
imagine this scenario that, let's say this, there's a, a family of, uh, with four children, you know, the, the mother and the mother, uh, father and mother and the four children, and they have this plot of land, and this, they, uh, this land sustained this family. They grew crops on it, and there were cattle. And here comes along a tyrant that took away this land. And as a result, one of the children died uh, you know, of starvation. Can you come along and say, well, just forgive the tyrant? You cannot. There must be a debt to pay. The land has to return, has to be returned back to this family. The tyrant has to be punished for the death of this one of the children through starvation. So you see, God cannot just say, I forgive you, without paying a debt to meet the justice. So it is a mystery that how uh, God himself, through Jesus Christ, can meet that justice by him dying on the cross for your sins and my sins, therefore paying that debt, and be able to give forgiveness. Therefore, it costs God a lot in order to bring about this forgiveness. That is a mystery. And Paul, zoom in, because uh, this letter to the Ephesians was written primarily for the Gentiles. These are the non-Jews who may not know much about the God of Israel, who has no clue about the, the, the Torah, the, the, the laws, because they were not brought up in that way. They might have been worshipping idols. And so Paul finds it's necessary to make a digression to talk a little bit more about the mystery. And so what is this mystery he wants to emphasize for the Gentiles? And in, the, in that next slide, in chapter 3, verse 6, he says this mystery is that through the gospel, through this good news, that God came in the flesh, died for our sins, and resurrected on the third day, that the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. This is the, re, uh, this is the revealing of the mystery affecting the Gentiles, uh, Gentile Christians. So why would Paul say that? I believe that Paul says that because Paul does not want the Gentiles to feel inferior. That they may say, no, the Jews are the chosen people. You know, we are the second class citizens. They might have heard of the, uh, the great empires of uh, King David and Solomon. They heard about this Herod's temple in Jerusalem that the Jews would go to uh, worship in. And then they say, well, now that we are accepted by God, perhaps we are still second class. I mean, who could we contrast with God's chosen people, the Jews? So Paul writes here to say, no, you are heirs together with Israel. But even then, they may think, well, maybe we inherit less than the Jewish people. And so Paul stressed it by, uh, by saying, you are the members together of the one body. Imagine if you are members of the one body, there's really no distinction. If you think about your body, any of your members of your body, would you distinguish to say, oh, this hand is not my, is not my body really, or this part is not mine? Because if you think so, just take a knife and cut it, and you see blood comes out and you yell in pain. So what Paul is saying is that you Gentiles, you must tell yourself, you must realize that you are very much part of the body of Christ as of the Jews, as of the Jews as well. And do not forget that some of these efficient uh, Christians are slaves. We, we read that later on in the chapter. So they may feel inferior, but, God is, uh, but Paul is trying to tell them that you are accepted by God. So the key word here is an acceptance by God as part of his family and do be part of that body of Christ. And secondly, not only Paul is trying to help the Gentiles not to feel inferior, but to help the Gentiles understand the importance of grace, that it is not because of their good works that they are saved. And therefore, he talked about his own life story, that he said that, you know, that he was the least of all the saints. He was the least of all the peoples. Why? Of all God's people. Why? Because he was a persecutor of the church. He was a blasphemer against Jesus Christ. Before he met with Jesus, before he received a revelation, he thought that he was doing the right thing. And so when he met with Jesus, he realized that I am the least of all the saints. I am not worthy to be used by God. But he says, but God calls me to become an apostle by the gift of God's grace. And he says that in verse 7, it was the gift of God's grace. And again in verse 8, the grace that was given to me to preach to the Gentiles. What has that got to do with the acceptance of the Gentiles? Paul is giving an example of his life story. He said, once I was the enemy of God. I was 
I, was, uh, I even gave the approval for Stephen, the first Christian, to be killed, to be stoned. I was there. I approved his stoning. But yet Paul is saying that, you see, God still called me to be an apostle. And in fact, unashamedly, he says that in verse 5, that this mystery was revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. So can you see the grace of God? On the one hand, to help him to realize that he was really the least of all saints. And he was not trying to, be, uh, to put on false humility. To say, oh yeah, I'm not really that good. I'm not really that good. But he really felt that I am the least of all saints. That was before he met with Jesus. And to the Gentiles, some of them may have felt it this way. That, you know, I'm not worthy. I, I was an a, a idol worshipper. I'm not worthy to be part of the body of Christ. But here Paul is saying that, yes, you may feel that. And that is right. When we think of our lower nature, when our, that was what we were before. But now that God has called me to even to be an apostle, in the same way you Gentiles, when God calls you, you must rise up. You must not despise your calling. Just as Paul himself did not despise his calling as an apostle. Imagine he went back to Jerusalem. And then he saw Stephen's, I don't know whether Stephen was married or not, but Stephen may have families, relatives. Imagine he met with some of his relatives, that he approved of the stoning of Stephen. How awkward, how sad it would be. You know, what would he say to, to the family of Stephen? But yet, Paul took on that role as an apostle to deal with it. So in the same way, when the Gentiles come to know God, no matter how bad your background might be, Paul is saying that by the grace of God, you should rise up to your call as a son and a daughter of the living God. You must not denigrate your calling, but you must rise up because it is the grace of God. You are the body of Christ. So, as, do you feel inferior? Do you feel that I'm not worthy to serve God? But Paul is telling you that, you know, if you're gifted, and God has given you gifts, every one of us has gifts, to so use that to bless one another. If you're a singer, then be a good singer for God. If you are a steward, then let us serve with gladness, with joy. If you're a cell member, serve the cell group. This, are, this is what it is, to rise up so that you are worthy of your calling. There was in Ephesians 4 verse uh, 1, to glorify God by the grace of God. And finally, uh, thirdly, Paul wants to comfort the Gentiles because the Gentiles may have felt that Hey, what is Paul talking about? On the one hand, he says we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in chapter 1, uh, Ephesians. We are lavish with God's wisdom. But Paul was not writing in the temple. He was writing while he was in prison. That's why he said, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. So they may have felt a bit inconsistent between what Paul is saying and what is a reality. But Paul was saying that, look, I am not a prisoner of Caesar. I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I understand and accept that it was God's uh, plan and sovereignty to allow me to be in prison for the sake of the gospel for you Gentiles. Paul may not have realized that, you know, because of his imprisonment, that he has to write these letters that form the bulk of many of uh, the, the letters in the New Testament. And Paul himself, through his model of suffering, became an example for us that we look back and say for Christians that are under persecution, you know, we look to the example of Paul. That Paul recognized that, you know, that uh, his suffering is for the glory of God, as he sums up in verse 13. So do not be discouraged, is what Paul says. And so often when we are accepted in Christ into the body um, of God, that in our service for one another, we do suffer. We may have to suffer, just as Paul did. And so often we Christians may have the wrong idea that uh, God has put us here on earth to be happy. That happiness becomes our goal. That if you are not happy, if you are not comfortable, then something is wrong with your faith. But that is not necessarily true. Look at Paul. He was suffering for the sake of the gospel. He was suffering for the sake of his service for others to fulfill God's purpose. And so often we may have to endure hardship all right, in our ministry for God. We may endure misunderstanding. We may have to endure the lack of maturity of younger brothers and sisters. We may have to endure persecutions from people who do not understand us. We may have to endure drudgery. You know, not a lot of work in God's kingdom is always interesting. Some can be just very boring and mundane. And so, 
we must have the right attitude that when God calls us, we must rise up all right, and not despise that calling. Whether you're young, uh, a youth, where you can serve God, you know, by helping out with your siblings or honoring your parents and your family, or you can be an evergreen that never says that, you know, there's, a, that, that, there's not much knowledge in you because God has a lot more for you and I to serve Him. And so, to help the Gentiles to further realize that Christ has accepted them, Paul says, I need to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ to the Gentiles. I need to preach that. That is his first task. Why do you think Paul needs to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ Jesus? Firstly, he says that nobody really deserves these riches. It is a gift from God. But very often, we focus riches on monetary terms, right? Riches, oh, treasures, gold, money, pay rise. You know, there was this story that Solan told me that uh, in, the, in the Chinese New Year, I think the Chinese New Year has just passed after 15 days, that uh, she had a very young nephew, all right, about maybe six years old, seven years old, and um, he received a lot of red packets. You know, in Chinese New Year, you get a lot of uh, packets with money from uh, your uncles, aunties, and parents. And normally, traditional Chinese will give not just notes, but also coins together with the notes. All right? That's part of the, uh, the tradition. And so this little nephew would take out all the money in the form of the coins from this red packet, but he left the dollar notes behind in the red packet. And there he was in the kitchen, uh, 30 years ago, they, they, you know, families use, they don't use gas. They still use like stoves with firewood. And so he started to throw all those empty, what he thinks was empty red packets with notes inside to feed the fire and watch them, you know, burn. And Solan walked in and said, I'm not sure whether he has cleared all the money from the red packets. And sure enough, she realized that this young nephew has not taken the notes out of those red packets. And he was throwing those red packets with the dollar notes into the fire. You see, sometimes we Christians are like that little nephew. We only think of certain aspects of the riches of Christ. But we fail to recognize other more important riches, not just the coins, but the dollar notes in that sense. And at first glance, you may think that the term unsearchable riches of Christ is an oxymoron, which means two words that contradict each other. What do you mean by unsearchable? Does it mean that you cannot find those riches? No, what this word unsearchable and in other translation means unfathomable means that you cannot explore to exhaust the limits of God's riches. You can, there is so much of God's riches or Christ's riches for you that for me, you can visualize yourself like in this picture on the slide where you're swimming in this ocean of Christ's riches. Imagine you swimming in the riches of Christ. What are some of these riches, you may ask? You know, people say riches are because they're rare. That's why it's called riches, right? If there's abundance, that's not riches. But it's, contra it's quite contradictory in, the, in how many terms that Christ's riches is available. It's so abundant, it's inexhaustible. And yet, they are riches. And Paul says, I need to preach to you Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ, to help you to realize that here, you can, you can visualize that you're swimming in God's sea or ocean of grace. You can never outswim. You can never deplete the resources of God's riches in your life. So these riches may not necessarily be money, but, this, but definitely the riches is that of the grace of God. There is the riches of His justification for you. And me. You know, when we think that we have sinned against God over and over again, that we say, maybe I've exhausted God's uh, mercies. No, in this unsearchable riches of Christ, when we truly repent, God will give you grace and God will renew your strength. There is also the, the ocean of strength for you. When you think that, look, I'm going to give up on this relationship, it's too tiring for me. You know, to raise up my children or, or to deal with my spouse or to deal with my neighbor and so on. God gives you the unsearchable riches of strength. 
That as you wait upon the Lord, your strength will be renewed like wings of eagles. You may say, Lord, this sorrow that I'm carrying is just too much for me. But you can continue to receive from God in this ocean of grace. The weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. There is enough grace for you to, see, to pull you through. Some of you know, the young people, you may think that, look, you know, I need to be accepted. I need to be able to survive you know, as I move from primary to secondary school or as I move from secondary school to university. I may not have the best looks compared to Justin Bieber or, or Miley Cyrus. At least I pronounced his name correct. Or I'm, I'm not born with a silver spoon in my mouth where I've been given you know, music lessons, common mats when I was growing up. I was disadvantaged, but hey, you have the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's why Paul is so keen to say, I have to preach to you Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And you have to realize that that grace from God is in you, through you, and you can never outpace it. And in fact, the Bible tells us that the Spirit of God lives in us and out of our, life, out of our inner beings will flow streams of living water that is already deposited in you. You just need to release that. You just need to realize that, that God's grace is sufficient for your every situation that you face. You have the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's why Paul says, I must preach to you. The unsearchable riches of Christ. So that you know that you are accepted. So that you know that you can function to your highest calling. So that you never tell yourself, you never talk down to yourself. Yes, when we think about the way when we have sinned against God, yes, we should feel like and accept that I'm the least of all God's people. That's correct. But when God then calls us, then we should also rise up because we, have, we are called. And that's why Paul made this digression in revealing this mystery to the Gentiles. And look at my life as a living testimony. So secondly, God says, that is uh, the task that uh, Paul is going to do. The second task is that he has to preach that the manifold, God's manifold wisdom should be made known uh, to the spiritual rulers through the church. God's manifold wisdom is going to be demonstrated through the church. You see, God will consider the church as his channel, as his as the organism or chosen instrument through which God's manifold wisdom will be shown. There's no other channel that God is using except the church. The church may not be perfect, may have blemishes, may be divided in some sense, but the Bible tells us that God will use the church. That is how his manifold wisdom will be shown through the church. And therefore, to God, his church is very important. After all, it is the body of Christ. Isn't your body important to you and me? Yes, very, very important. So that's the same way that God says, I love my church. I will prepare my church, make her ready to be like a bride for the bridegroom. But you may say that, well, Paul is an individual. You know, didn't God use an individual? Yes, Paul is an individual, but he's not individualistic. You see, therefore, there is no place for individualism because God will not use individualism. His manifold wisdom is not manifested through individualism, but through the church. And of course, Paul is an individual, but he's not individualistic. His giftings and apostles were used to start ch uh, plant new churches, to go around encouraging other churches, even going into prison for the sake of the good news for the Gentiles. This is what Paul did as an individual, but yet he's very much connected to the body so that the manifold wisdom of God can be, uh, can be demonstrated. You see, many Christians think that, you know, we can just come to church, maybe give your tithe, and that's all you, you do as Christian. That's not true. You must really be committed as a member of the body of Christ. This is very important because individualism is a spirit of the age that we will be contaminated. And therefore we need the word of God to refresh us 
We must abandon this consumer mindset. We must be committed to a local church. All right? Whether it's this church or another church, but you are committed to a local church where you serve, where you accept, now that you're accepted by God, that we accept one another and also be included into the body of Christ. Now, to help us to think a little bit more, imagine a football team, all right? If you are a team player in a football team, you cannot just think for yourself. You cannot just say, my aim, the aim is to score as many goals as possible in the, op- uh, the, uh, the opposition's uh, net. But we have to realize that we have to operate as a team. If we do not operate as a team, then we will fail. If you are full back, you probably will not be the, the main shooter. You probably pass the ball to the midfielder. So, as a team player, you are aware of your surroundings. You know where the opponent's opposition is, you know, with your fellow team members. And you're there to support your team member. You may not be the one to, to score the goal, but we all part and parcel, aware of the dangers that our brothers and sisters are in. We are supporting that. At the same time, we pass the ball around so that you know, the best person will be able to shoot the goal. If we have that mindset that I'm not just here attending a church, but I'm there to support the work of the kingdom of the church, I will do my part. I will support my brothers and sisters in my cell groups, in their homes, in their families, in their workplaces. That's all part and parcel of being a body. And do you know what? When that happens, God's manifold wisdom is demonstrated. Perhaps why we don't see so much blessings of, of God is because we, we are too individualistic. We are not in the body. We look like we're in the body of Christ, but mentally, spiritually, emotionally, we are disconnected. And this is, I believe, what God wants us, uh, this passage to hit us uh, this morning. I mean, we have two uh, prophetic pictures this morning in our prayer meeting. One is uh, from Richard about, you know, perspective. You know, sometimes we see, oh, there's a huge mountain ahead of us, but actually it's just a zoomed-in uh, image of a model. God's resources, God's riches are far greater than your problems. But God wants you to lean on Him, to trust Him, so that you get to know Him. This is important. This is in the heart of God, that through all the trials and testing, that you get to know God. Okay, if you're not a Christian today, you need to know God to get your sins sorted out. All right, so that your debt is paid. But if you're a Christian, you still need to grow to become more like Christ. This is God's intention. Not just bless me, bless me, but God wants you to grow to become more like Christ. This is in the heart of God. And, we need, and God will bless it only through the body. All right, by working, interacting with one another. We help one another to grow. Even through... Uh, you know, people being rude to you and so on because of immaturity. We just have to help one another. This is God's plan. And God's manifold wisdom will be shown. And if you look at James chapter 3, verse 17, you know, we, we talk about this wisdom of God. Here, we, we read about the wisdom, the heavenly wisdom from God is like this. The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial and sincere. It's very strange that the heavenly wisdom of God didn't talk about suddenly your IQ jump up by 200 points. Suddenly you can walk on water. Wow. Suddenly you can make great business decisions. That can happen. But the attributes of God's wisdom is to do with relational stuff. Is that not true? Right? It's written by James. Chapter 3, verse 17. It's pure. Our motives must be Correct, that's first. Peace-loving, we're not there to, to attack one another. We're not there to create problems in the body. We're there to make peace with one another. We are to, to be considerate. We're not there to be rude, you know, to hit back at people. We are to be respectful to one another. This is all what James is talking about, to have the wisdom of God. We're not overbearing. We don't boss people around. Submissive. We don't insist our own ways. If we are wrong, we stand to be corrected. That's part of submission. If I'm wrong, I will be ready to be corrected and say, yes, brother, you're right. I am wrong. I'm sorry. Full of mercy. We don't go around condemning one another. 
to say you're no good, you're not good, and so on, I'm better than you, but compassionate, full of mercy, right? To be able to help somebody who's weaker than you, who may even have sinned, to say, brother, how can I restore you? Sister, how can I help you? How can I serve you? How can I encourage you? Impartial. There's no favoritism, all right? You treat everyone with the love that God gives us. Sincere, no hypocrisy. Authentic, to be the real person. What you are outside is what, what you are inside. So this is the wisdom of God. The manifold wisdom will flow out through the body. And what, what does the word manifold mean? It means it's a variety. Like the different hues of color, you know, in the autumn color, while wow, you have, you know, pale green, uh, darker green and different shades of brown and yellow and so on. And so God's wisdom is, is different variety. Perhaps a church is not as blessed as it can be because we have not allowed God's wisdom to flow through the body. Therefore, I want to encourage all of us to suddenly to, to think about in this coming week, am I really a member of the body of Christ? Think about the football team. Where are you in the field? Are you spectating? Or are you in the field? Even if you are in the field, are you just thinking about shooting the goal by yourself? Or are you aware of the opposition? Where they are with your fellow team members? How are you going to pass the ball around in order to secure as many goals as possible in that game? This is what God wants us to do. So one thing is that we must have the right perspective. You have the unsearchable riches of Christ. So no excuse to say, oh, I'm, I'm not good. You know, I'm not like this, I'm not like that. No, I believe God has given us a place, a son, a daughter to start with. And you minister out of that identity of who you are. So don't talk down on yourself. Like Paul, he says, I'm an apostle. And yet he can say, I was the least of all saints. He has no problem to deal with those two extremes. So you may say, yes, I'm weak. I have certain uh, addictions. I have certain tendencies. I have certain uh, weaknesses. But yet, do not fail to recognize that you're a child of God, that you can receive and swim in that ocean of grace, that God can work out his purpose and over time to mold you to be the person he wants you to be. So we need to be the body of Christ. Another picture that we saw this morning, our prayer meeting, is that there is this man dressed in like white, you know, robe, you know, more like in the hospital gown sort of thing. And he was lying down, but his heart was beating rather strongly. You can see the heart like popping out of his chest. And the interpretation is that this is the church, right? But the Spirit of God is moving, but the body is not, that, is not active. It's still, why? Maybe it's not connected to the head. Because another aspect is that it's not just we need to be committed and connected to one another, but where is the head? Who is Jesus Christ, right? We read that in the earlier chapter in Ephesians. It's only when the head is connected to the body, then the wisdom of God will flow through the body. So we need to ask ourselves in these coming seven days as well to think about, am I a member of the body? Is Christ the head of my life? Am I communicating with him? Am I having the thoughts of Jesus in my life, in my day-to-day -day living? That is important. That's why Paul made this digression especially for the Gentiles. And I think all of us here are, are Gentiles, as far as I can see. And finally, Paul says that the heavenly powers are affected. The manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the spiritual rulers through the church. So it's not just for us to see, but spiritual rulers, both good uh, angels and bad demons, actually watch us in this game. And depending how we operate ourselves, whether we are body or not, whether we are becoming more like Christ or not, whether we are swimming and receiving that grace of God in this ocean of spiritual riches, then the heavenly powers are affected. Do you know that the Bible tells us that when one sinner repents, there's joy in heaven, right? The angels rejoice. So they must be observing what's happening on earth. So what we do on earth has implications in the cosmos, even in the heavenly realms. God sees everything. The angels watch. So I believe that whenever we love one another, we, have a, we, we show encouragement to one another. 
when we minister in the grace or the gifting that God has given to us, there is rejoicing and worshipping in heaven. And the greatest activity in heaven is worship. It's not that God needs that worship, but do you know that we are made to be worshippers? And you are the most blessed and happiest people when you're actually knowing, when you really know how, when we are really worshipping God. So angels are there, you know, they just say, oh, another hallelujah chorus. Because one of you was willing to step out of your comfort zone, exercise faith to be a blessing to others or to people who do not know Jesus. There is a hallelujah chorus because you have decided to wake up early in the morning to pray and start, you know, this is my act of love for the body of Christ because God has put in my heart to pray. There is a hallelujah chorus in heaven when you choose to forgive someone that has hurt you and to love your enemies. Wow, there's even a greater praise because this is not a human thing. How can you love your enemies? This is not natural. It is supernatural. So the angels are watching. And whenever I believe that there is a hallelujah and a praise, you know, the demons just have to, oh no, I can't bear this. We have to move away. That's why the demons are there to cause disunity. Because once a body is disunited or a body is not connected to the head of Jesus, all hell break loose, literally, you know. So we need to know how we engage in this spiritual warfare as to understand that God's manifold wisdom is through the church. And I'm not talking about Emmanuel Church. I mean through the body of Christ. And that, can be, that is worldwide. But, but our, our interconnection uh, to the body of Christ cannot be to every, every Christian around the world. It's not possible. So God has placed us the local expressions of his church in the form of local churches like Emmanuel Church is a local church. All Souls is a local church. And HTB is a local church. And so on. And we are to be members, committed members of one of the local churches. All right? So that is what we need to do. And also we need to connect to the head of Christ. So to conclude, Paul has given to us this, uh, this uh, explains this mystery that he has been entrusted by grace to reveal and he was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. What a wonderful apostle he has been to all of us Gentiles. And there he made a digression in his wonderful literary, literary piece you know, of praise and doxology because he has this heart as an apostle to say I have to make it clear to the Gentiles that they are accepted by Christ. That this mystery means that they are heirs, joint heirs, with God's chosen people, the Jews. That's why I'm so glad that, you know, there was a trip to Israel uh, by some of our people, and Emmanuel Northwest, you know, is uh, bridging with the Jewish people, because there's a huge big barrier between the Jews and the Gentiles, you know that. And the devil will try to keep that separate as much as he can. And I'm so glad that um, uh, Anthony and... and uh, Shehi is there to, to, to bless, to help to serve a, a Jewish congregation, a Christian a Messianic congregation. So all this is, is happening. And we need to continue to build up one another in this body. And also don't forget the head, right? Because without the head, there's no wisdom coming through. So we need the headship of Jesus and we need one another. We need to be that. Tell yourself, am I in the football team? Okay? We must be there, passing ball, aware who is next to you, how are we going to strategize to, uh, to score goals. And if you're, fe- if you're feeling lacking in yourself, then tell yourself that you're swimming in that sea of God's rich, unsearchable riches. You're swimming in the sea of God's limitless grace. My grace is sufficient for you. Even in our suffering, okay? My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weaknesses. Let us also be aware this week that what we do is observed by both angels and demons alike. Okay? Whatever you do in the open, whatever you do in the secret, you cannot hide from this. You cannot hide from this. All right? That, and we should say that you know, every inspired good work that we do for God will generate praise in heaven. 
Okay? And every evil or sin that we do, you know, the, the demons will have an upper hand in your life. And that can also affect the church, not just you, right? Because we are together. So if you have gangrene in the finger, it affects the whole body. So you have to think about the consequences as well. And when you have a blessing, that blessing will also flow throughout other people. So let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that um, you have included the Gentiles into the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord, that you made us part of your body. Thank you that Paul in this chapter preached about the unsearchable riches of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. Lord, we thank you for these unsearchable riches and we pray, Lord, that you open our eyes of our hearts to lay hold of what are these unsearchable riches of Christ, the riches of justification, that we are justified by faith, or the riches of in the sea of hope, where you give us, Lord, that living hope, the unsearchable riches Lord, of your provision, unsearchable riches, Lord, of your kindness, the unsearchable riches, Lord, of your glory. Oh, Lord, help us that, Lord, we would live worthily of your calling as sons and daughters of the living God. Thank you, Lord, that you are with us. Thank you that you are for us. You are not against us. Help us too, Lord, to unite ourselves, Lord, to let the manifold wisdom of God to flow through the body, the church, that there is unity in our midst, that though we are not perfect, because, Lord, we just continue to grow together, that let us appreciate, Lord, help us to appreciate one another. Help us in our hearts to be pure, peaceable, full of mercy, good fruit, considerate, submissive, impartial, and sincere. Thank you, Lord, for one another. Thank you, Lord, that you are carrying us through. And Lord, we want to declare, Lord, that even this body, Lord, will be alive and well, doing the purposes of God, fulfilling the call of God in our generation. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, with our eyes still closed, I want to make an appeal to those of us who do not yet know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know, you, your sins are still there, hanging over your head. Who is going to deal with the justice? Who's going to, how are you going to deal with the justice that has to be meted on the wrongs that you have done, except by the blood of Jesus? And if today you do not know Jesus, but you want to find out more about Jesus, or even to consider giving your life to Jesus, I just want you to stand up so that we can pray for you, and afterwards, uh, someone will go and talk to you as well. So is there anyone? So just stand up and say, Lord Jesus, I need to know you. I need to deal with my guilt and my sin today. You need that courage, all right? And so just stand or raise up, yeah, put your hands up. Is there anyone here? Just very quickly, put, raise up your hand. To ask Jesus to say, I want to know more about Jesus. Is there anyone? Quickly raise your hand high so that I can see. Okay, if not, why don't we all stand? And let's just let's just pray in our, in our spirit. Let's just pray in our spirit. Thank you, Lord. There are a few points to pray about. One is, are you a member of the body of Christ. If not, then why not? And this member is not just being a member of Emmanuel Church, all right? It's a member like that of a football team actively playing the field. Are you in the field? Are you connected? Now, it may not necessarily be your fault, okay? Maybe nobody was uh, able to talk to you and so on, but you're going to pray to God to say, Lord, I want to be involved. I will be not waiting for someone to come and talk to me to be involved in the ministry, but you know, I'm going to take some initiative here. And God's going to give you that grace, all right? Because we all live by grace.
So why don't we just pray? Let's just spend the next couple of minutes just praying to the Lord. Yes, Lord, help me to be that effective minister of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Let's all pray. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just pray. Let's pray, Lord. Jesus. Two minutes. Thank you, Jesus. You can pray in the spirit or pray in English, whatever. Just, just pray, Lord, I want to be a member so that the manifold wisdom of God will flow through the body so that God is glorified. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Let's help me to help myself to you, Lord Jesus. To be a member, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, that we are called the house of prayer so the second point is really to pray for um, Christ to be preeminent right? the headship of Christ be upon your life upon this church, upon this body so that the manifold wisdom of God can flow through the church right? can we do that right, in the next uh, two minutes we need to just pray, say Lord be the head of my life thank you Jesus be the head of over this church Let's all pray. Come, let's continue to focus. It's good. All right. The house of prayer for the nations. Let's learn to pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. We just call on you, Lord, to pray. Lord, you rule out over our lives, over this body. Thank you, Lord. Move, Lord, by your spirit. Cause us, Lord, to be alive in Christ. Let me worship you, Lord. Oh, we just praise you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your manifold wisdom. We pray, Lord, for your manifold wisdom. Lord, the flow, Lord, through this body, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And the third point, the final point, is really to pray for the blessing of God to touch one another. Imagine you're swimming into this ocean of God's grace, all right? That is flowing into, into, in and through your life. That's already there in your life, okay? The Spirit of God is living in each one of us. It's about you appropriating it by faith. So can we do that? Just to thank God for His unsearchable riches in Christ Jesus. And pray that we will be a blessing to others. Thank you, Lord. Make us, Lord, to be a blessing. Lord, to others. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Let's pray, Lord, that you be a blessing to others. Thank you for accepting us. Thank you for including us. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
let's come together like let's just worship the Lord for a while just realize that we are one body all right we are interdependent of one another we may be individuals but we are not individually sick we are members of the body of Christ so I'm gonna ask the worship team just lead in a time of just worshiping God uniting our spirits together is important all right they say we want to bless one another we are members of the body of Christ Let's just sing the spirit.
Well, there's a glorious calling upon our lives. You know, we are sons of the living God, as together with God's chosen ancient people, and called to be members of the body of Christ, and God delights to pour His manifold wisdom through His body to show to the spiritual rulers and the powers in the heavenly realms of His manifold wisdom. What a privilege. And God wants to show us more and more of His wisdom, of His power, so that we know Him more. And for us to understand and receive the unsearchable riches of Christ Jesus in our lives. To swim in that ocean, how vast that ocean of God's love and kindness to us. Christ is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And Christ is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have the supremacy. And blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us all, the body of Christ here in Westminster and Emmanuel, for this day and forevermore, that we'll know the unsearchable riches of Christ, to meditate on this in these coming days, and to look to receive the manifold wisdom of God through the church as God demonstrates that to the spiritual rulers and powers even in the heavenly realms. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So go forth to serve the Lord with gladness. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So Spirit, come.